So about a month ago, I did a hardcore Nuzlocke and Pokemon Shield using only Ditto. It was one of the dumbest, most tedious, soul-draining hardcore Nuzlocke I've ever done, and naturally I wanted to do it again. Well, since then, there's actually been a YouTuber stupid enough to also attempt this challenge. And that of course being Papa C. Seriously, thank you for the shout out, I really appreciated it. And if by some series of coincidences you've landed on this video before theirs, please check it out. It should pop up in that top right info box thingy, and I've linked it in the description. Because, as I'm about to spoil in 5, 4, 3, 2, you've clicked off the video by now, it got rough towards the end, specifically at the Pokemon League. And during the video, I found myself subconsciously planning out a route, getting a few ideas on how to hammer away the challenge myself. So while it wasn't the next game I was planning on playing to scratch my Ditto shaped itch, I figured why not pick up where they left off as I have a few sneaky, somewhat scummy tricks up my sleeve to put my own spin on this challenge. I've listed the rules of a standard hardcore Nuzlocke on the screen so you can read it at your own pace, but one slight change that I mentioned from my last Ditto challenge is that I won't be limiting the amount of Pokemon I bring to a gym this time, as I felt that adding that rule last time made me rely a bit too much on luck. While not the game I'd intended on playing, this actually works out well as when I made my original video, this was one of the three games I shortlisted as being feasible to do, at least without having to rely on an abundance of luck. But we're getting ahead of ourselves. First let's pick our starter. So when picking my starter, I usually go with the one that would make the run hypothetically more difficult. Well in this challenge, since we can't use our starter and we'll be transforming into the rival's Pokemon anyway, I decided to go with Tepic because Embor's probably the strongest out of the three, and this means I won't be allowed to use Embor. For encounters, I preloaded my box with a bunch of Ditto, or with varying IVs to emulate me catching them in the wild, and I'll just be adding them to the team when I get a new encounter. So the thing about Ditto is that when Ditto transforms into the opposing Pokemon, it copies its exact stats, including any buffs and debuffs. So most battles will be a mirror match, where the side that has more HP to spare usually wins. And guess which is the one stat that Ditto doesn't copy? And its base HP is terrible. At this stage of the game though, all enemy Pokemon's base HP is pretty low, so it isn't really an issue yet. These initial battles should be pretty easy, though you could potentially lose a Ditto to a crit. In Straighten City, after beating Sharon, he gives us some Oran Berries, which brings me to another point that I wanted to share. Unlike in Pokemon Shield, in this game, berries aren't renewable. For whatever reason, unlike the previous two games that had a pretty good solution to this, this game has no way to grow berries. And unlike its sequel, you can't rebattle Pokemon Rangers to get berries. The only way to get renewable berries was through the Dream World, but those services have long since shut down. And while there is a not too legitimate way to still access it, even to someone like me who thrives on rule technicalities to use shady tactics, this felt a bit too cheaty for me. Though I'm not saying that other people can't use this method. The most important rule to remember when playing self-imposed challenge is, your run, your rules. The reason I went on this detour about something that seems minor is that berries in this challenge are actually a very big deal. The only thing that separates a Ditto from the Pokemon it's transforming into is its health and the items it's holding. Combine these two factors together, and Berries basically grant Ditto, a Pokemon that has meager health to spare, anywhere between 20 to 25% extra HP, which could mean it could take an extra hit, or even two. Pretty important when fighting a mirror match. And this was one of the reasons why I picked Shield over Black for my initial video. Sorry, I do like to over explain my thought processes during my videos. And there's more where that came from. Speaking of Berries, during the first gym I learned about a secret function of the pickup ability. That being, there's a chance that a Pokemon with that ability can pick up and use any discarded items. Not only that, but it can stack. This gym's pretty straightforward. Both Cress's Pokemon use Work Up, increasing their attacking stats, which we can copy. And since we have four Ditto to use by this point and ran into no unfortunate crits, we got through with no losses. The rival battles at this stage of the game are still easy, so we can move right to the gym. Lenora starts with the Herdia, who has Intimidate. The way this works is that the faster Pokemon's ability triggers first. So in this case, Ditto's faster, so Imposter activates, which lets us intimidate Herdia, but in turn, she also gets to intimidate us. If she was faster, then she would intimidate us before the transformation, which means that when Ditto transforms, the stat drops will be overwritten anyway. And on top of that, Ditto would get an intimidate off on Herdia. But since that's not the case, what we can do is immediately switch out, thus copying Herdia's attack drop, but also dropping it further. Meaning with all the Intimidate Mons, we can always have a higher attack stat than them. Lenora's Watchog is pretty scary however, as there's nothing we can do to stop a boosted Retaliate, as it's always faster than Herdia, and switching will give it a free turn anyway. Thankfully it goes for a crunch letting Lillipup live, and losing the Retaliate boost. 
Well, it gets the Hypnosis off the next turn, we have the power of switching on our side, and can slowly use Retaliate of our own, winning the battle with no losses. Two badges in and no losses. Not bad. No outright threats yet, but badly placed crits could have been a problem. However, we've reached the point now where enemy Pokemon's HP has begun to outclass our own. This is also where my video will begin to diverge from Papa C's, as I'm sure you don't want to watch the same video twice. Although that would be in line with the spirit of this challenge. Moving on to Castelia City, we get some new materials, one in particular being game changing. First we can get three new encounters, Sandile, Zorua, and Victini. Then we can get a smoke ball, which is for my own personal sanity as running away from wild encounters that you speed tie with is hell. An Eviolite, which unlike Shield, is still very useful as it will give us a defense boost right from the start for a lot of trainers before the late game. And a Quick Claw, which while still reliant on luck, will increase our chances of moving first from 50% to 60%. None of these feel very game changing yet, do they? Well that's because I saved the best for last. Papa C kinda touched upon this when he spoke about many items being locked away behind the battle subway, which we can't get as they don't allow duplicate Pokemon. But I'd argue, out of all the items you can get in the battle subway, there is one that outclasses them all. In fact, I'd go as far as to say that this is the only item that you'd want for this run. And if you played any competitive Pokemon, or watched my last Ditto Nuzlocke, you would know that the item I'm talking about is the Choice Scarf. If you didn't know, the Choice Scarf gives you a 50% boost to your Pokemon speed right from the start. In exchange, you're only allowed to use the move that you choose on your first turn. Why is this a big deal? Well in the challenge where we always speed tie with the opponent, this is the one item that will bypass the coin flip entirely, and allows us to always move first, making many battles where we need to win the speed tie, guaranteed. Point number one why I felt this challenge was doable in this game. This also happens to be the only game outside of Shield where we can get one during the main campaign, without even needing to partake in the battle subway. In the Castalia Pokemon Center, hidden away in the top left corner, there is a very suspicious man that seems a bit too excited about us training Pokemon with strangers. Well, here's a warning, this is when my run starts to become a bit scummy. Technically speaking, while the rules do state that I can only catch the first Pokemon on a route, it's usually accepted that this only applies to Pokemon that you use in battle. After all, how else would you get HM servants? And also, trading Pokemon is accepted as long as you don't use the Pokemon traded to you, as that's how you would get access to trade evolutions, which I allow in my runs. With those things in mind, I head back to Route 2 and catch 30 HM servants for reasons. And hit up 30 of my very real friends, all with a functioning DS and a copy of Pokemon Black with the save data on hand, and ask them to trade with me. And they all just happen to give me a level 5 Snivy called Subscribe. Wild. We can talk to this suspicious man, and he gives me a wide lens, an Everstone, a zoom lens, and a choice scarf. I can absolutely see people not agreeing with this, but by my personal rule set, as long as something is technically possible to do without cheating and within a reasonable time frame, it's fine by me. If the Pokemon catch count is the issue, you can still get the choice scarf, but you'll have to wait until after the 7th gym where you'll have access to more than 30 encounters on hand. Believe it or not, this isn't even the last of my long drawn out explanations for this run, but if you're somehow still watching, don't worry, we still have a ways to go before the next one. On to the next gym. Unfortunately, despite all that talk, the Choice Scarf doesn't really make much of a difference for this gym, as his main threat isn't the Dwevil or the Leaveny that can hit us for super effective damage, but his first Pokemon, Whirlipede, who can't do much damage to us, but likewise, we can't do much damage to it. On top of that, Berg has not one, but two potions, which also happen to be Hyper Potions, on the third gym. Don't get me wrong, I want more difficulty in Pokemon, but not quite through overpowered items. This lets Whirlipede heal right back up to full, while we still have to stick it out with the damage it's already done to us. Twice. We do lose Rock and Roller to a pursuit on the switch, but eventually we can whittle down Whirlipede's HP, burn through Berg's potions, and Purloin takes it down with the final pursuit. And this one Pokemon's the reason why I decided to omit my limited Pokemon rule. Next is Dwebble, who has Smackdown, a move that we can use to hit each other for super effective damage, and my team's already in rough shape. I get a Poison Tail off to try to go for a Poison, but decide to sack Pansage, which gives me a safe switch into one of my healthy Pokemon. Blitzel loses the first speed tie, but pulls through on the one that matters, taking Dwebble down with a Smackdown. Believe knees out and is likely going to go for a random move, so I sack Blitzel to get at my Scarfer, Tepig. Tepig gets to move first using Struggle Bug, also lowering Levani's special attack, and Levani uses String Shot to bring Tepig down to its level. However, at this point we've already won the battle with the initial lead, as Levani will never do as much damage as us. 
I am forced to switch into Purloin as Zitter can only get five power points. Have a one final struggle bug gets us the third badge. What a long segment. But trust me, the choice scarf was worth the long lecture, as it's going to be vital during upcoming battles. And I wouldn't want people thinking that I just hacked it in illegally. I'm a lot more subtle than that. Both Bianca and Sharon are still pretty easy, but Sharon's duod gets four defense drops in a row with Razor Shell. Luck is 50-50, but I never got one. I also lost Victini to an air cutter from Bedov, but a few crits are to be expected. On to Nimbasa, we get to double our available Ditto counts and get asked on a date by N. Or a, a bit of a red flag, but at least he's honest. And then he proceeds to take three Dittos from me. Really though, this end fight is actually pretty hard. Sigilyph and Darumaka have a lot of raw power, and Scraggy can hit itself for super effective damage, the switching's tough. And Sandal can trap you at Sand Tomb. No second date from me. We're still at a point where we have plenty of Ditto encounters coming up, but I have sour memories. Alessa's one of the easier gym leaders as it's easy to exploit her AI. She leads with the Morga, which means we transform into a Morga, and since it's neutral, she'll always go for Volt Switch. While both her and Morga are still healthy, she'll most likely keep switching between them. Alessa actually did outplay me during one turn where she used Pursuit on my Volt Switch, and a crit from that would have killed. Eventually one Morga does go down, but instead of using Volt Switch with the next one, she hard switches into his Zeb Striker as we raise its special attack with our own Volt Switch. But that works for us as we can just switch out, copy Zeb Striker's stab boost, then get another when it uses Spark. My Scarfer, Trubbish, is able to outspeed and after many, many, many flame charges, Arkans finally able to take Zeb Striker out with a final quick attack. Imorgo goes down to a plus two volt switch. Pretty easy battle. The worst thing that could happen is you lose a Pokemon to a crit, but it's pretty easy to play around those here. Of course they found a way to sneak Charizard in. In Driftwale, we have our infamous battle with Clay, but we don't actually need to make any additional preparations. Clay leads with Crocorock, and this Crocorock has Moxie. I send out my Scarfer, Trubbish. Instead of attacking, I actually go for a Swagger, raising Crocorock's attack, as Crocorock does the same. The only thing we would have been worried about was a crit bulldoze, but the smart AI usually always goes for the confuse if they don't see a kill. But we aren't worried about the confusion. Instead I switch right into Seawaddle. And Crocorock breaks out of confusion turn 1 using bulldoze, leaving Seawaddle on 8 HP. Oh no, what will we do? Sack Seawaddle is what. But Yash, doesn't Crocorock have Moxie? Yes it does. And we switch back into Trubbish, copying all of its stat buffs. A plus 3 Bulldoze one-shots Crocorog, giving Trubbish a Moxie boost. A plus 4 Bulldoze one-shots Palpatode, giving Trubbish a Moxie boost. And the Choice Scarf allows Trubbish to outspeed. A plus 5 Bulldoze one-shots Excadrill, winning us the 5th badge. And this was one of the battles where I wanted to make my own video on this game. Even if you don't have the Choice Scarf, all you need to do is win one speed tie to sweep Clay, and survive one crit from Excadrill. You more than likely have enough Dittos to replace some unfortunate accidents by this point. We have another battle with Bianca, nothing special but we get the HM for fly, and with a new level cap we have a new little sneaky hack available to us. First we head back to the Charizard bridge, catch a shiny Ditto, and fly all the way back to Nacarine city. From here we head west to the pinwheel forest outskirts and we're now at a high enough level to cull the population of Ordino, with next to no risk of losing any of our own Pokemon. And conveniently, there's even a nurse nearby. And if you haven't watched any of my previous videos, if something's doable in a reasonable amount of time, with no risk of losing Pokemon, we can use certain methods to speed up that process. All that's to say that from here on out, all of my Dittos will have max HP EVs. EVs aren't something I usually give myself, but I feel for this particular challenge, I think I deserve it. It doesn't really make too much of a difference, as here if we compare a Ditto with max EVs and max IVs with a Ditto with no EVs and no IVs, the difference is about 50 HP at level 50. And this is us comparing the best with the worst at endgame levels. In reality, with our Dittos, the difference between max EVs and no EVs is probably about 20-25%, which is still an extra hit. And back onto Skyla, I did end up losing one Ditto to a crit to a random trainer in her gym, but she herself was pretty simple. Sweebat kept using Calm Mind, but since we're also a Sweebat, we could take advantage of the unaware ability to shrug off all the boosts, all while doing a lot of damage ourselves. I should have switched into my Scarfa to use her boost against the rest of her team, but I forgot in the moment and took it down with a Pokemon that was already weakened. Unpheasant opts to use Razor Wind, which has charged me with only 80 base power, so we often got an extra hit. And we could just send out the still healthy Scarfa to win the one-on-one -on -one against Swanna. Also, the flinch has helped. The last few gyms have been surprisingly easy. I was struggling against pretty much all of the gyms during my shield run. Having a full team probably helps. On the way to Icarus City, we have another battle with Sharon, and this is where the rival battles could start getting difficult. 
Sharon leaves with Unpheasant, who Omogo gets a turn 1 flinch against, granting it enough of a lead to win the 1 on 1. Next to the stupid little monkey, and reigns up so he can safely stay in for an air slash, and get off a couple of roos to bring Omogo back up to full. Unfortunately we've run out of power points so we have to switch. Gothita uses 5 licks, not getting a single paralysis, and then tries for a fury swipes. Still not getting the kill, Dorumaka is able to clean up though. Jort's the main reason why this battle is somewhat risky, as while Rain didn't help Simisir, it certainly helps Duat. And even a not very effective water pulse does a bit. Jort's best move is revenge, and Zora's quick claw activates at the worst time, moving first not getting the boost. Jort on the other hand does get the boost, but it doesn't get a crit. Eventually we're able to take it down with revenge, Trubbish needing to push past the confusion to do so, but our team's in pretty rough shape. Lastly is Lipard, and I try for a revenge but Lipard uses fake out bringing it low. But this brings me to my next strat. Lipard's actually one of the easiest Pokemon for Ditto to deal with. Almost all of them have fake outs with no other moves to hit for neutral damage. So what we can do is keep switching between Pokemon using fake out while the most Lipard can do is use not very effective moves. Also Lipards for some reason really like using Torment in this game which of course doesn't matter to us. And that's Sharon. Thought I'd at least outline one battle with him. Right on to Bryson. Bryson's Vanillish has mirror shots, so I send out my EV Lad holding Darumaka and it outspeeds hitting mirror shot and also lowering its accuracy, causing Vanillish to miss. Another mirror shot puts Vanillish in heal range and I managed to get a hit this time. A heal laser, mirror shot once again lowers Vanillish's accuracy and this actually isn't good for us. And then both Pokemon miss the next turn. Bear in mind, we only have 5 power points to spare so we're going to need to switch. Darumaka lands its final mirror shot and once again lowers its accuracy. Oh no. As a last ditch effort, I try for a frost breath, but of course Bryson heals. Now we have to switch, and as you probably expected, those accuracy drops we gave Vanillish, we too have to share. I send out my Scarfer early, and Trubbish dodges the attack on the switch. But then it misses its own attack while Vanillish uses acid armor. Then it misses another. And another. But Vanillish also misses. The next one finally manages to hit, and Vanillish misses again. Can Trubbish hit the final one? Yes it can. God that could have gone so much worse. But next up is Bear Tick, and this thing has swagger so it should be an easy one right? Well I'm still a Vanillish so I switch out to Zorua holding the Quick Law, but it loses the 40% chance and gets hit by swagger itself, and then hits itself. Brian doesn't get the kill, and Zorua hits itself again knocking itself out. Gothisa's turn, and Bear Tick wins the speed tie again getting off another swagger. And then Gothita hits itself. We've lost 5 coin flips in a row now. That's a 1 in 32 chance. Gothita does manage to win the speed tie this time. And also snaps out of confusion getting off a swagger. Bertek doesn't hit itself and uses slash bringing Gothita low. Then Bertek outspeeds bringing out of confusion turn 1 killing Gothita. How many coin flips have we lost on this one Pokemon? Into Purloin and yup Bertek outspeeds to use swagger. But Purloin pulls through getting off a swagger itself. Bertic hits itself, then Perloin hits itself. I don't know what I was thinking, and I switch into Trubbish, and of course a plus 4 slash kills. Why did I do that? Now with my Scarfer gone, the strategy I was building up for goes down the drain. Into Molga, my only healthy Pokemon, and we finally win a speed tie. A plus 4 slash bringing down this terrifying Pokemon. Or not. Why? Of course it's Swagger. Bertic wins another speed tie, but slash doesn't kill. However, confusion does. Back into Purloin, and we win the speed tie, finally bringing down this terrifying Pokemon. Cryogonal goes down to a plus four slash. Oh wow, a crit. What actually happened during that battle? How many 50 50 chances did we lose against Bertic alone? Why did I send up my Scarfer? What was I saying about gyms being easy? These are all questions we'll swiftly move past as we've won, and that's all that matters. We have a pretty long stretch of Team Plasma battles, but the only 5 Pokemon they use are Scraggy, Crocorock, Trubbish, Lipard, and Watchog, all of which we've dealt with plenty of times. On to the next gym. Speaking about easy gyms, a Dragon Gym in theory should be really tough, even when it comes to its regular trainers. But we have the Choice Scarf, letting us basically outspeed and one-shot every Pokemon. We do have to sack one Ditto to retransform our Scarfer, but aside from that, smooth sailing. We are forced to fight this beast of a man, but as we've discovered from other traders, Axio evolves into Fracture and one-shots Draydens with Dragon Tail. Next is Dragon, who gets to move first hitting Chip away, and then Dragon Tail doesn't kill but brings out Haxorus. I bring out Venipede. Goodbye Venipede. 
Axio evolves into Haxorus and outspeeds to use Dragon Tail one-shotting Haxorus. Two futile heals later, I'm forced to switch out as Dragon Tail is negative priority and the chip away could kill. I send up Herloin and Dragon Tail activates Rough Skin, winning us our final badge. In what universe is Bryson the hardest gym leader in a Gen 5 challenge? Before moving on, we have another battle with Sharon, and this time we actually lose two Ditto. Samurai and Torrent tears through my team, and this time Lipar doesn't have fake out, meaning we actually have to deal with it. It also has Unburden, which means after it eats its berry, it will always outspeed my Dittos, including my Scarfa. Also on your way to the Pokemon League, avoid this trainer at all costs. I didn't, and had to find out the hard way that she has a Swordsbug, who has Sapsipper and only grass moves. I had to actually PP stall a Pokemon for the first time during this challenge. This is probably my favorite victory road. I mean, just for the badge gate alone. It's such a cool entrance, why did they never do that again? In fact, why did they replace that in black and white too? But with that, we finally reached the Pokemon League, and while I feel my run's been different enough so far to justify its existence as a video, I'm sure those of you who've watched Papa C's video, this is the part that you've been waiting for. And I, in fact, do have a plan. Is it a good plan? It's a plan. Also, I should note that I usually set my level cap to be 50 for this game, but considering our circumstances, I feel this is fair. Not that it makes much of a difference. There is only one final preparation I need to do, and that is collecting gems. With the smoke ball and repels, you can get gems from dust clouds risk-free, so no beating around the bush. I gave myself the gems I might be using. If you've watched this far, you already know what's fine by my rule set. Will my plan work? It better. I even use the showdown damage calculator for this one. So on paper, starting with the hardest elite form ever sounds sensible. You have the most dittos to deal with them after all, but I decided to challenge the easiest one first. And there's two reasons for this. And the first being to level up my team. I've trained all my dittos so that they're 1 XP away from leveling up, so this battle should get some of them to level 55. And the second reason's a more debatable one. And that is with easier Elite Four members, in my opinion it's easier to keep Dittos alive longer. Whereas if you start with the hardest one, you'll likely lose quite a few during that battle alone, making the ones that should be easy far more difficult. Like I said, the logic's debatable. Point number two as to why I feel this challenge is feasible is that all the Elite Four members only have four Pokemon. And the easiest Elite Four member for this challenge is Grimsley. Grimsley leads with Scrafty, and this one has Moxie. I think you already see where this is going. Jolte gets to move first, using up its fighting gem and using Brick Break to do over half. Scrafty goes for Sand Attack. I switch into my Scarfer, Fungus, and Brick Break wouldn't have killed even with the crit. Of course, Fungus can outspeed, finishing Scrafty off, and more importantly, getting the Moxie boost. That crit absolutely didn't matter. Next is Lipard, who goes for a Fake Out and then Attract? I'm going to be completely honest, I was working off the assumption that Attract shouldn't work against Ditto. Is it because Scrafty was a male? Fungus wasn't expecting to find love. Lipard goes for an aerial ace and thankfully Fungus snaps out of it and a plus one brick break one shots Lipard. That crit absolutely didn't matter. A plus two brick break one shots Bisharp, giving Fungus a moxie boost. However, Intimidate from Crocodile cancels that one out. And I'm not entirely sure if Fungus can survive an earthquake. But it turns out it can. A plus two brick break one shots Crocodile. I'm pretty sure that crit didn't matter. And that's Grimsley. Only needed two Pokemon and I didn't lose either of them. I did get three unneeded crits, so I'm not sure if that's the game telling me that it's all downhill from here. The next Elite Four member I go for is Marshall. Marshall leads with Throw, and Throw has no moves that hits for super effective damage, and Storm Throw always crits, meaning we always know what's the most amount of damage it can do to us. But Darumaka's fighting gem boosted Storm Throw reveals our weakness against Throw, its enormous HP base stat, almost three times that of Ditto. Honestly gave Darumaka a fighting gem since I had no better plan. Another storm throw puts throw into heal range. And this is really all we can do until Darumaka gets low and we can switch into Terrakion to use another fighting gem boosted storm throw, finally finishing throw off. Next is the Ace Conkelda. I switch right into Alomomola as it takes a hammer arm, doing well over half. But now Alomomola can move first. I decided staying in is the smartest decision, so I use a hammer arm doing over half, and one from Conkelda takes a Lomomola out. I send up my Scarfer and Fungus hammers away at Conkelda. Next up is Mianxiao, and I see no reason to switch, so after taking a jump kick, hammer arm puts Mianxiao into heal range. A heal from Marshall, then a hammer arm later, we're back to where we were. A crit would kill, so I switched with my quick claw holder Stunfisk, and a jump kick crit would have killed regardless. I don't know why I switched. 
but Stunfist gets the 60% chance and Mian Xiao goes down to retaliate, which crits. Thanks. Lastly is Sork. I dare you to say it. I switch out to Terrakion on the Karate Chop. Karate Chop's scary as it's got a high crit chance and we really don't want to see a crit. After trading Karate Chops, I switch into Joltik and we've basically won as a crit from here won't kill. And a fighting gem boosted Karate Chop knocks Sork out. Or not. I either got a low roll or I completely messed up my calcs. That's fine. All I need to do is switch into Fungus and dodge the 1 in 8 chance. Which I don't. One of the worst time crits this run. I send out Stunfisk. And I get the 60% roll. Goodbye Marshall. I played this one horribly. This one definitely needed more planning and I may have panicked halfway through. I could have saved one more ditto, but with that trajectory, this could have been the end. But that wasn't even the battle I was dreading. Up next, despite what I said earlier, I decided to go for the one that I thought would be the hardest out of the league. Caitlyn. She has bulky psychic types, and the first one, Reuniclus' strongest move, is Thunder. Which is fine for the AI, she has nothing to lose. But sucks for us, since we can't rely on that. After Reuniclus is done chipping us down, the rest of Caitlyn's Pokemon all have super effective moves to clean up the rest of my team. And with 4 Ditto, whether I like it or not, this battle is actually dependent on luck. But I do have a plan, so let's see how that goes. The worst thing Reuniclus can do is outspeed, hit thunder, and paralyze, which is roughly a 10% chance. Darumaka actually moves first, hitting a grass gem boosted energy ball doing over half, and Reuniclus hits thunder, and also paralyzes. At least that happened second, otherwise I would need to hope that Darumaka doesn't get immobilized. A thunder won't kill without a crit, so I may as well stay in. Reuniclus moves first, and thunder misses, and even more miraculously, Darumaka's own thunder hits, taking down Reuniclus. And that was insanely lucky. Well about a 50-50, but you've seen how my luck's been so far. I switch into Joltik, and of course get the special defense drop. I need to switch, so into Stunfisk. And Mashana goes for Reflect. Why? Mashana moves first again using Shadow Ball, not even doing half, and a Ghost Gem Booster Shadow Ball does over half. Mushana moves first again, but doesn't get a crit. Stunfisk's one finishes Mushana off. I need to switch out, and I figure Darumaka's already paralyzed, so it's time to say goodbye. I switch into my Scarfer, Terrakion. Ice Beam would do more, but I go for a Shadow Ball, putting Sigilyph into heal range. Two futile heals later, Sigilyph goes down to a Shadow Ball. And with Gothitelle out, Terrakion uses a final Shadow Ball, doing just under half, but lowering her special defense. Her own Shadow Ball puts an end to Terrakion. All I need to do is win the speed tie, or dodge a crit. And Joltik wins the speed tie, a ghost gem boosted Shadow Ball wins us our third Elite 4 battle. I didn't actually need that defense drop, but I guess it's nice to have some mental security after that Sorg blunder. Man, I've had the best and worst luck during this Elite 4. But what's important is that we made it this far, but we only have 2 Ditto left. Is it even possible to win against Chantel with 2 Ditto? I'll spoil it, the answer is actually yes. But with 2 Ditto, we now have to dodge 3 crits, and a 1 in 3 chance. If we lose the 1 in 3 chance, it's not over, but then we're forced to win a speed tie. All in all, the chances of us winning is roughly 68.6%. But with how my luck's been, it may as well be 50-50. It's actually a bit higher considering I could also crit, but I'd rather not be hopeful. Let's just start the battle. Chantel leaves with Kofa Grigus, and I send out Stunfisk, who's holding the Choice Scarf. Shadow Ball does over half, well thanks for the defense drop, and Kofa Grigus' Shadow Ball doesn't crit. And there was a chance I could have used Will-O-Wisp, but why dwell? Chantel goes for a heal, but the next Shadow Ball takes Kofa Grigus out. Next is Jellicent. I know I outspeed, and Shadow Ball does over half, well thanks for the defense drop. And Jellicent goes for Brine, which doesn't crit. Another Shadow Ball takes Jellicent out. Finally it's Chandelure, and it's time to say goodbye to Stunfisk. But wait, why are we sacking our Scarfa? Well, despite Chandelure's monstrous special attack, it can't one-shot us without a crit. Even with max special attack, it's a 70% roll for a kill. And well, this is an Ultra Sun. They don't do that yet. But this means that neither can we. Unless, of course, we get a little boost from an expert belt. Joltik doesn't win the speed tie, and Chandelure's Shadow Ball doesn't crit. An expert belt boosted Shadow Ball is able to take down the final Pokemon in our way, and we have beaten the Elite Four. Oh. We have beaten the Elite Four, but what are we actually going to do with one ditto? Well, on to point number three as to why this challenge is definitely possible. And if you play this game, you already know. 
Like in Pokemon Shield, we now have the opportunity to replenish our Ditto stock right before the champion battle then. And it's pretty clear we absolutely need it. Man, this is making me concerned for future challenges. We catch Unova's legendary Pokemon, but the real legendary Pokemon were the Ditto we caught along the way. We bring our true final team to the champion battle. Ben leaves with Zekrom, and surprisingly, it has no dragon moves. Basculin starts off with a Zen Headbutt as Zekrom hits Fusion Bolt. I start off with an early gem boosted to Giga Impact, and it brings Zekrom into heal range as Zekrom sets up a light screen and heals up as Basculin recharges. Basculin's next Giga Impact crits, and Zekrom takes this chance to use its own. But the next turn, Basculin can use a Zen Headbutt while Zekrom recharges to bring it down. Vanalux comes out as the light screen fades, and I switch out to my Scarf at Joltik as Vanalux uses Frost Breath. Joltik outspeeds to use a Flash Cannon, doing over half, and Vanalux uses Hail for some reason. Another one takes it out. Next up is Kling Clang, so I switch into Cupchu, expecting Gear Grind. Wait, what? Why didn't Cupchu transform? Oh. Oh no, this is Zoroark, isn't it? Okay, maybe we can pull this around. Okay, Focus Blast missed. God damn it, Zoroark. Can we all agree that that's some bullshit? So how do we move on from here? Well, Nuzlocke's are meant to be lost, so you can learn from them. Hey, what's that behind you? No, there, really. Don't you see it? Keep looking out for it. Alright, must have been my imagination. As I was saying, Kling Clang's out, so I need a clean switch to keep my Pokemon healthy, so I go for a Flash Cannon. And it was Zoroark all along. Man, that could have been bad. Jolte goes down to a Focus Blast. I send out Cupchu, holding a Quick Claw, and it wins the 60%, taking Zoroark out with Retaliate. I'm really glad we got this out of the way before it became a problem. Next up is what I'm assuming is the real Kling Clang. Flamethrower just misses the kill. But Kling Clang misses Metal Sound. Why does it even have that? Another flamethrower melts Kling Clang. Karakosta comes out, and Cupju's still at full, so I stay in for a Focus Blast, which hits, and activates Sturdy. Stone Edge doesn't crit. I switch into your mask, holding an expert belt, take a waterfall, and an Aqua Jet finishes Karakosta off. Finally, it's Archeops, who gets off a Stone Edge, which doesn't crit. And a waterfall brings Archeops down, defeating N and making us the champion. First try, baby. Let's go. But of course, that's not the end of the game, for there are two champion battles, and there's a reason why the level cap's 54. We're immediately thrust into a battle with Getsis, and we don't even get a chance to switch up our Pokemon, and more importantly, our items. Which means, for the hardest battle in this game, we don't have our precious choice scarf. And guess this leads with Cofagrigus, and I send out Basculin, who's luckily still alive. Otherwise, that would have been awkward. Basculin now speeds, hitting a Shadow Ball, which brings Cofagrigus below half, and also gets a defense drop. I'm getting so much good luck when I need at least. Cofagrigus hits Toxic. Cofagrigus attempts to Toxic Storm me, and succeeds. Twice. But Basculin now speeds to use Shadow Ball, bringing down Getsis' first Pokemon. Toxic alone has brought Basculin below half. Next up is the Electros, and this thing sucks. We can't hit it for super effective damage, and we have no items that benefit us for this thing. And as we've learned, this means all we can do is slowly whittle it down with flamethrowers, while it does the same to us. The difference is, guess this can use a forest stall. So as we finally bring Electros down, our team's already in rough shape. On the second Pokemon. Next up is Bufalant, and I need a clean switch. Basculin's already poisoned, so goodbye Basculin. Why did Bufalant use Wild Charge? And Basculin survived, but it couldn't win the speed tie. Goodbye, Basculin. I send out Frillish, and Frillish moves first, hitting the normal gem boosted head charge, which also crits, taking Bufalon down. We finally got a crit that actually might have helped us out. I mean, a boosted head charge could have been a one shot anyway, but let me be hype. It's the terrifying Hydreigon. Clean switch time. Goodbye, Clink. I send Cupchu out, who's still holding the Quick Law. It wins the 60% to use Dragon Pulse, and it somehow doesn't kill. Goodbye, Cupchu. I send out your mask holding the expert belt, but Getsis has already used all of his heals, so we don't get a free hit. And then Hydreigon wins the speed tie. But your mask survives, and the expert belt is enough to pick up the kill. We're on to Bishop, and Fire Blast doesn't screw me over, your mask picking up another kill. We're actually on to Getsis' final Pokemon, Seismitoad. I genuinely wasn't expecting it to make it this far. But your mask's final order is to act as a clean switch. Dragon Pulse does just about half, and Seismitoad uses Sludge Wave. 
Goodbye, your mask. I send out my final Pokemon, Frillish. Seismitoad moves first and uses Rain Dance. Why? Frillish gets off an Earthquake. Seismitoad just barely hanging on. But Frillish wins us our final speed tie using an Earthquake, dispatching off Seismitoad and the Nuzlocke. I had some of the best luck and some of the worst luck during this Nuzlocke. I guess that just kind of happens when every turn is basically a coin flip. If I've done one thing, I think I've proven that this Nuzlocke is basically impossible without a Choice Scarf. Because otherwise, how are you actually supposed to get past that Zoroark? The only thing you can really do is hope for a Focus Blast miss, if it even uses that. Again, a big thank you to Papa C for giving me a shout out, and thank you all for sticking around for the entire video. Hey, how about throwing me a little like and subscribe as well? I can see you clicking off this video. Joke's on you, it's already over. I'm really loving these challenges. Somehow I think this one was actually easier than my Pokemon Shield one. Probably because I was using four teams, but also because people underestimate how hard Shield can be when you ban Dynamaxing, especially when you can't use Protect. But this one's given me some trust issues for future ones with how the League went. Is it even possible to do this challenge without a Choice Scarf? I guess we'll have to find out in the future video.